developing tonight, a surge in polling for President-elect Donald Trump as he rides the tailwinds of his surprising November victory. Mr. Trump appears to be experiencing a bit of an extended honeymoon phase with the American public when it comes to his popularity. A new Bloomberg poll out today shows that he is at 50 percent, marking a 17-point jump since August. What is more, the same poll found that the percent of American adults who believe that the country is on the right track is now at its highest place in four years. So what's contributing to these jumps and can it last? Probably not. Most of these things go up and down, right? Our Fox News Digital Politics editor, Chris Dyerwalt, is here to explain tonight. So Chris, very nice move. Is this normally what we see with a, a president-elect? Well, it's, it depends on how you're rolling when you get there. In Donald Trump's case, he may have squeaked over the finish line to a certain degree, but he has gotten a, a the, the honeymoon is more pronounced for him. It, Barack Obama came into office popular. He went into election day fairly popular eight years ago. This time, Donald Trump was lugging what looked like overwhelming negatives. People were very down on him. You remember a month ago, it was just a month and a day ago that we had the election. A month ago and three weeks ago, people were saying, should Donald Trump be normalized? Should, and critics said, should the president have even welcomed him to the White House? And all this stuff. A month later, you know what we're saying? Well, half the country says they feel pretty good about him. And, by the way, on his core policy sets, people are willing to give him the benefit of the doubt. So Trump definitely has changed the landscape around him. You know, he always said that he could be presidential, and you know, I remember even Paul Manafort, who you know had a short stay in the Trump campaign, said, "Well, he, you know, likes to start out on the edges, and then he'll kind of move his way into the middle." You've got Al Gore and Rahm Emanuel coming to meet with Donald Trump, um, That's right. and it's, you know, and <laughs> Kellyanne Conway said that President Obama and Donald Trump have sp spent 30 hours on the phone together. What, I That's mean, a lot. is that is that That's possible? That's a lot of hours. That's a lot of I hours, spent man. I've been hours on the phone since eighth grade, so I, I, right. don't know if, I don't know. I don't know what they're talking about, Chris, but they have a lot to talk and, about. And I can picture they're twisting the cord yes. around your finger exactly, as you're my talking to your friends. I know. Uh, I would say that what part of what Donald Trump is benefiting from is that there was a caricature of him that certainly that his political opponents, Hillary Clinton and the Democrats, laid out there, but also that was in the press. He's a Nazi. He's a monster. He's evil. He is uh, going to drink the blood of the children of America, hot, run and hide. He's the Krampus. And then he showed up and people went, oh, he's kind of funny. I, I think I like him. And he's so doing this moderate. when you start there, you, right. you then can only go up. Good. That's right. And he's being moderate and he's making these cooing noises that liberals like, even though he's appointing people that are really conservative. Fascinating. Chris, thank you very much. Always you good bet. to see you, sir. Come see us in the morning. All right, so let's jo be joined now by Republican Congressman Sean Duffy and Richard Fowler, a Fox News contributor and nationally syndicated radio talk show host. Welcome, hey, gentlemen. Martha. Hello there. Good to have you all here. So, Richard, I know you, got a, you were smiling broadly <laughs> as Chris and I were talking. What do you think about all that? Well, I think there's some, there's some truth to what Chris is saying here. I think every president gets a honeymoon phase after they win. The American people are looking for him to provide answers and to create jobs and to build this wall and all these other things. And so I think that's what we're going to wait to see what happens. Now, I think Donald Trump has a couple of problems. I think problem number one is, is this. As he gets into his first 100 days, he's going to want to pass this trillion-dollar transportation or infrastructure bill, which I think is a great idea, if done correctly. And I think budget hawks like Congressman Duffy and others will be like, oh, trillion dollars is too much. We need to lower that number. And that's where you're going to see the big eruption that will be Trump taking on his own party. Well, Representative Duffy, I thought it was interesting uh, in the interview that Donald Trump did today. He said, I would like to be judged on my presidency starting now, starting when I got elected, because the Dow is at an all-time high. I mean, the market has responded incredibly positively so far to the Trump transition part of this process. But if he comes forward with that bill, are you going to give him a hard time about how to pay for it? So, uh, well, it depends. If he doesn't pay for it, we'll obviously have trouble with it. But there's great pay for us. I mean, we can patriate uh, foreign profits back to the states, whether we mm -hmm. charge 5, 8, 10 percent interest. Uh, you can pay about three or four hundred uh, billion dollars of that trillion dollar expenditure. But listen, Martha, we're a trillion dollars in debt. To think that we're going to add another trillion uh, of unpaid spending on top of it, it's not going to happen. But what is interesting is liberals across America, like maybe a little bit of Richard, their hair's on fire. They're pulling it out. They can't believe the evil Donald Trump is actually, you know, warming up to the American people, and they kind of like him. They want to give him a shot. Uh, What's uh, interesting uh, is, listen, one second. Only, only 28 percent of Americans want Democrats to oppose Donald Trump and Republicans in Congress. They actually want them to work with us to secure the border, fix health care, and grow the economy, uh, which is really remarkable.
for Democrats now to have this push from their own side to say, work yeah. together and get some of these big initiatives done. Well, you know, I, I find it fascinating because you know, this, this is really what I think is the most interesting. So, Richard, tell me, you know, uh, do you believe, are you willing to give Donald Trump a chance? I mean, the people were sobbing and, and devastated after this election in, you know, half of the country, essentially, right? Um, are they starting to feel better or do they think this is not real? Well, listen, I, I, I respect the presidency of the United States, the person in it. That's a different story depending upon who it is every four years. Uh, um, but here's the thing. I think the American people, they were angry uh, and they were frustrated. They felt that the economy was rigged. I think millennials especially felt that going into November, going into last month, as Chris Steyerwalt said. And now Donald Trump has to prove that he can really, quote unquote, make America great again. And uh, like Congressman Duffy pointed out, he's going to have some trouble in his own caucus making that a reality. The same thing that he's proposed the same thing Barack Obama proposed eight years ago, a trillion dollar infrastructure bill, and Republicans blocked it tooth the, and nail, and, the and he just indicated they're going to do it again. So to all the, well, no, no, all no, no, no. the Donald Trump supporters out it, there, you, you have it right here. Richard, remember when uh, they were, this was an $800 billion spending bill under Barack Obama, and they said there were shovel ready jobs, and there were no shovel ready jobs. Wait, so that $800 that, that's billion, not true, Congressman. you got nothing for that we money. Donald Trump all, we've builder had 60 would actually consecutive build months of job growth. And, and, and airports. 60 consecutive but $800 months. Billion was wasted. But one Richard, point, hold on. But Sean, just you, quickly before we go, because I'm, I'm pretty much out of time, you know, what's well, the best way to pay for it? Quickly, uh, repatriate profits uh, from overseas. Yeah. Best way, but we're going to do health care. We're going to do we're, we're going to do the border. A lot of issues that Americans have bought into. This is one issue we'll get to, but it's Big not going to be the fourth Trump one. On party, the, Martha. Democrats are going to like him on this. You're going to bring bipartisanship yeah, you know in Donald Trump. You know what I always say? Yeah. Actions speak louder than words. So we'll, we'll see what happens. Um, and if he makes good on those promises, then uh, he will have made good on them, uh, I hope which he is does, tough to Martha. do in I hope Washington. He does. Okay. Well, thanks, Martha. Consensus. Richard, thank you very much. Thank you, Martha. Great to see you both. And welcome to Hannity, former Speaker of the House, Newt Gingrich. He'll be here in just a minute. But first, the people in Washington, D.C., and the political elites, well, they're not President-elect Donald Trump's friends, and they never will be. And that's tonight's opening monologue. Now, Donald Trump, he's been meeting with the likes of Mitt Romney, Chicago, Mayo, Rom, Rombo, Deadfish, Emanuel, people like Al Gore. Now, my advice to the President-elect tonight is be very careful. Now, while President-elect Trump, he considers Romney for Secretary of State, he should remember all of the vicious and nasty and horrible things that he said about him on the campaign trail. If we Republicans choose Donald Trump as our nominee, the prospects for a safe and prosperous future are greatly diminished. Now, Donald Trump tells us that he is very, very smart. <laughs> I'm afraid that when it comes to foreign policy, he is very, very not smart. Dishonesty is Donald Trump's hallmark. Think of Donald Trump's personal qualities. The bullying, the greed, the showing off, the misogyny, the absurd third grade theatrics. Here's what I know. Donald Trump is a phony, a fraud. His promises are as worthless as a degree from Trump University. It's pretty vicious. Do you really want him in your cabinet? Then there's Rombo Deadfish Emanuel, the mayor of Chicago. He has deep political ties to President Obama and, of course, the Clintons. Now, he was at Trump Tower earlier today playing nice, but just recently, Emanuel has said he will oppose Donald Trump on sanctuary cities. Take a look. To be clear about what Chicago is, it always will be a sanctuary city. Now, administrations may change, but our values and principles as it relates to inclusion does not. Then, of course, you have global warming alarmist, former Vice President Al Gore. He was at Trump Tower earlier this week. However, we have to remember the campaign attacks that came from the former Vice President and all the crazy stuff he said. Like, watch this. Hillary Clinton will make solving the climate crisis a top national priority. Her opponent, based on the ideas that he has presented, would take us toward a climate catastrophe. We face a genuine planetary emergency. We cannot just talk about it. We have to act on it. The planet has a fever. If your baby has a fever, you go to the doctor. If the doctor says you need to intervene here, you don't say, well, I read a science fiction novel that tells me it's not a problem. They are in favor of affirmative action if you can dunk the basketball or sink a three-point shot. 
but they're not in favor of it if you merely have the potential to be a leader in your community and bring people together. Don't tell me we've got a colorblind society. Of course, Republicans are racist, as global warming, fear-mongering. Now, there's also President Obama. Now, early this morning on the Today Show, Donald Trump talked about his relationship with the current commander-in-chief. Listen to this. I've now gotten to know President Obama. I really like him. We have, I think I can say at least for myself, I can't speak for him, but we have a really good chemistry together. We talk. Uh, he, he loves the country. He wants to do right by the country and for the country. And I will tell you, we obviously very much disagree on certain policies and certain things, but, uh, you know, I really like him as a person. President Obama has been one of the worst presidents in American history. That's just a fact. Now, the president-elect, I, under I understand, he's taking the high road here, and I guess probably he should to bring the country together. But to me, it's pretty obvious that President Obama is putting on a front in front of the country. Now, our own Ed Henry, he's reporting that the president is planning a farewell tour in mid-January with major speeches in up to three cities. The likely goal, to undermine Donald Trump before the inauguration and, of course, to try and alter the political narrative. Now, as we've said before, there's no way that President Obama will follow in President George W. Bush's footsteps and, out of respect for the office, not criticize the next commander-in-chief. President Obama is a divisive, radical, left-wing ideologue. Always was, always will be. And once he's out of office, he'll be going after Donald Trump the same way he did on the campaign trail. We might remember this. And this is somebody who spent 70 years on this earth showing no respect for working people. This is somebody who vilifies minorities, vilifies immigrants, vilifies people of Muslim faith. If you disrespect women before you are elected president, you will disrespect women when you're in office. If you accept the support of Klan sympathizers, the Klan, and hesitate when asked about that support, then you'll tolerate that support when you're in office. And finally, there's the Republican leadership in Washington, D.C. Now, I'm glad to see they're late in the game. They're finally coming around and supporting Donald Trump. But I'm an old Reagan guy, and I think it's worth remembering his admonition, his famous line, trust but verify. So my recommendation to the president-elect is to set the agenda and push for that legislation that he wants first. And then Republicans in Congress can do what they want later on. Now, Washington, it might seem like a nice place, but as Trump has said, it's a swamp. And as soon as things get even a little bit tough, those people, these newfound friends, the political class, they will turn on him on a dime. So if the president-elect, if he wants any real friends in Washington, well, I heard he just got a dog called Patton. If he wants two friends, get two dogs. All right, joining us now with Reaction, the deputy executive, executive director of the Trump transition team, Dave Bossy. Dave, good to see you again. How are you doing? Thanks for having me. Very um, well. Very well. If you don't have a position yet. When are you getting your position? <laughs> I don't know. You'll have to talk to uh, the president-elect about that. Um, well, obviously, you, you played a big part in the campaign, so I would expect you probably are going to Washington with him, and, and you and Bannon work well together. We've all been friends for years. All right. Thank you. Maybe uh, let me give the president-elect more credit and for being more gracious than I would be, more magnanimous than I would be. I'm beginning to worry, though, because to me, a guy like Governor Romney who called him a liar, a racist, a misogynist, unfit for office, a fraud, and a huckster is not the type of guy that I think is going to be loyal when things hit the fan. And you and I have been around this game far too long to know that those moments are coming. The people that were loyal to him during the campaign will be the people that will be best and loyal during tough times. And tough times are coming. Well, look, we're, we're going to have some tough times in the White House. Uh, president-elect uh, Trump, then when he becomes President Trump, uh, will obviously be uh, challenged when it comes to our economy and to, you know, across the world as, uh, as he engages all of the problems that we have uh, today. Look, I, I believe that what... what President-elect Trump has done is an incredibly deliberative process. He has really cast a wide net. Uh, he's talked to a lot of different people about the Secretary of State's job. And, you know, if he feels that Mitt Romney is the right man at the right time for this job, then I don't know that I... What does he have to be Secretary of State? Well, you know what... The, like Rudy Giuliani's traveled the world. Sure. Newt Gingrich has traveled the world. 
You know, Mitt, Mitt Romney has, is not somebody who's lived, lived under a rock. He is somebody who's well experienced with, with negotiations, well versed, uh, uh, and has traveled to himself uh, around the world. I'm, I'm not that worried about that. I, I think that the president elect will make the right decision Look, for him. He ran, he got elected. I didn't That's, run, I didn't get elected. It's he his call, it's not my call. I understand. But I guess the single biggest percentage of calls to my radio show, 550 stations, we have a lot of people listening, is about, well, why is he meeting with Al Gore? Why does he say he's friends with Obama? Why is he meeting with Mitt Romney? Why is he meeting with um, some of the other people that he's been meeting with? Well, look, he, he, Rahm Emanuel, <laughs> Dead Fish, he does, let me ask this question. He does know they're not his friends. He understands oh, I, that. I, I, look, you know. The, the president-elect is not He's smart. He, he is incredibly smart. He understands that that what these folks are about. But he also is somebody who's trying to show America that he wants to be president of all of the people. Something that okay, he ran I can, on. I can and accept I think, that. That's I think smart. that having these meetings is incredibly smart for the optics of showing the American people he will take guidance and advice, whether or not he takes the advice and adheres to the advice, he will at least listen uh, from a lot of wide-ranging uh, voices, and I think that those are some of them. To me, it's all about the agenda. There's no point in winning an election if you're not going to advance the agenda. And the That's agenda right. to me is simple. Originalists for the Supreme Court, extreme vetting, corporate tax 15 percent, repatriation 10 percent, eliminating Obamacare, health savings accounts, energy independence is a big part of job creation and I think the creation of wealth in this country, and education back to the states, building the wall. If he does those things, he'll have a successful presidency. Right. I heard him reiterate those points last night, so I have confidence the agenda is the same. Will, and I love the generals that he appointed. Mm -hmm. Will that agenda change, or do you think some of these people he's talking to will have a negative influence on him? Look, you know, the president-elect has uh, in his mind what his agenda is. He ran on it. He understands it. He believes in and it. And he's been repeating it. Uh, without question, every day uh, since the election and, and, and for a year before. So no one needs to tell him really what his agenda is. And I think that is what we have to count on, that, that the people that he is bringing together, his cabinet, mm -hmm. the, the generals, uh, and, and, and uh, uh, Steve Mnuchin at Treasury, and, and Wilbur Ross at right. Commerce, and these other incredibly talented people that he's bringing together, Ben Carson uh, at HUD, which is interesting, is going to really allow him uh, to get that agenda uh, forwarded for the American people. I just, to me, I think loyalty is the best trait you need in an environment like D.C., where if you want a friend, get a Pat and a dog. <laughs> right. And if you want two friends, get two dogs. Um, it's a tough town. And, it, it is. And, and look, President Trump, when he They're is not going to like him, is, is going to come for him every day. Dave, uh, good to see you. Thanks very much. Right. So Donald Trump is getting strafed in part by the media over taking on Boeing. You probably know the backstory. The president elect with a single tweet. That's the way he communicates, folks. Get used to it. Uh, said that the Boeing's uh, contract, he said, uh, for $4 billion to build the next Air Force One was too costly. Cancel the order, he said. Well, it's a little more complicated than that. We now know Boeing actually has a $170 million contract to plan the next two Air Force One airplanes. It's the only American manufacturer capable of doing this and uh, has been building these planes going back to FDR. Uh, so uh, the Pentagon estimate or the, whoever's overseeing this would be about 3.2 billion, so it's not 4 billion. That's not the part that interests me because it's certainly fair to critique uh, what Trump did and indeed the way in which he had negotiated with Carrier over saving uh, those Indiana jobs rather than going to Mexico, then made a similar demand of another Indiana company. Uh, this also goes back to the call with Taiwan. I mean, Donald Trump is constantly getting hammered by the press for doing things differently. Excuse me, have we not been through a year and a half campaign where he did things completely differently than anybody else had ever done, uh, did all kinds of things with a collective media establishment, uh, wrote him off, said he'll never recover from this, he's going to implode, he is self-destructive, he's not going to win the nomination, he's not going to win the election. Yeah, well, that's the way he is operating as president-elect. So the Washington Post has this big front page piece yesterday. Uh, using Boeing as a peg for what I'm talking about. And it says the following, that all of this, all these episodes I've mentioned, have left many wondering, many, it's a journalistic little trick there, 
whether this would be the unusual and unpredictable way that Trump will govern when he takes office next month. That style, including his opaque uh, personal financial dealings and his sudden shots at certain companies, says the Post, has helped unnerve a corporate America that traditionally craves stability. Some business leaders and economists have worried whether executives can speak their minds about the president-elect or his policies without fear of facing Trump's rage. Well, I am really, really concerned about these corporate executives that crave stability. Just imagine if they don't have stability, what will this world come to? Now look, it's perfectly fair to cover these things, to find out all the details. Maybe Trump didn't say it right. It wasn't a $4 billion contract. Same thing goes <coughs> for the the um, debate about whether or not the president-elect and the president of the United States should be negotiating with particular companies. Isn't that winning, picking winners and losers, which conservative Republicans do not like? All of that is fair game for coverage. But what, what just riles me up again and again is this shocked and horrified coverage of Trump's style. The guy makes snap decisions. He makes everything personal. He uses Twitter as a weapon. That's how he is going to be president. Why would anybody think that's going to change? Now, it may well turn out that once he is in the White House, this is not a good style for governing, that it's going to backfire more often than not. And of course, that should be covered too. I'm not saying he gets any kind of pass on this. But it seems that the media are almost slapping their foreheads again and again and again over the fact that Trump is not a, somebody who quietly negotiates things, that he doesn't have a lot of patience for processes and protocol, takes the call from the uh, president of Taiwan, even though years, decades of protocol would dictate that he not do that. Turns out Bob Dole's lobbying firm was involved in setting that up. So I, I, I'm all for aggressive coverage of the new president. I'm all for raising these questions about how he does business and how he relates to business. But maybe this style that he has, that, that the uh, you know, majority of the Electoral College voted for, maybe that will prove effective for him. And I just think that by questioning it over and over and over again, this is shocking, this is horrifying. How can he do this? That the media are fighting the last war. Here now with reaction, the author of the number one New York Times best-selling book. It's a children's book. It's Take Heart, My Child, A Mother's Dream. Fox and Friends co-host Ainsley Earhart and Fox News contributor. By the way, first time since you've been a contributor, Taya Kyle is with us. Honored to have you both back. Number one New York Times bestseller. Thank you. She's, she's the hero. You no, know we're, that. Okay. No, she's I, the hero. All right, you both are heroes. Congratulations to both of you. Thank you. you. Uh, why can't they just be honorable and say, okay, he's the guy of the year? Yeah. Now, they always say for good or bad, okay, he's not Adolf Hitler. It's not the divided states of America. It's the United States. We have a few differences, but it's always been that way. Yeah, we've always had differences. I mean, that's, that's part of being free and having different opinions. Usually we're one group with differing opinions, and we're still the same one group. Nobody seceded. You know, nobody's really well, leaving California's the country. California's on the verge. They talk about it, right? I mean, yeah. Texas has talked about it, too. But if they, if they actually do it, we'll see. That's a whole other thing. I mean, there's one thing to throw a tantrum and say something extreme, which brings me to my other point, and that is that people have a voice now. With the Internet and social media, everybody can be extreme. We have 315 million, you know, plus people, and everybody gets that voice. I think when I'm at Walmart, when I'm in airports, when I'm in public all across this country with everyday people, we are not divided. We're very nice to each other. We're good neighborly people. We look out for each other in line. We, we help each other out with our bags on the airplane. Yeah, I do that all the time. I'm yeah. helping everybody out online. You're not in public and basic public <laughs> anymore. Just, so, you know, so I'm just saying, like, that everyday people like me, um, are, we're fine. We're not divided. But social media, that, it, this is mainstream media. They're yeah. upset that they didn't win. They like to have control. They don't like Donald Trump tweeting because they want to control the message. So, of course, they're going to put him on the cover and put the divided states of America. It's obvious. Obvious, he's going to be the most interesting man or person, like it or not. So he's got, he had to be on the cover. They, everyone would have been blasting them if he, they hadn't put him on the cover. So but in order to, to put him on the cover, they had to take a shot at him. Mm -hmm. He said it was rude or he said it was snarky on the Today Show. I was asking some people who voted for him what they thought, and they said they're not surprised by it, but this is a slap in the face. They said that President Obama is the one that's divided the country, that ISIS wasn't even part of our country, that hits mm -hmm. home for you, mm -hmm. and, and before President Obama took office, that um, jobs, companies were moving to Mexico. He's not even president yet, and he's already creating jobs or, or you know, keeping carrier here in the country. You, you grew up in South Carolina. You worked there in television. You worked in Texas on television. When you were on my radio show, when we were talking about your book, you talked about this other 
country. Well, people in the That's middle, in what we call the flyover states, right. people in, in middle America, in the South, we're just, you're from Texas, we're just trying to put food on our table. We are trying to make our lives a little better for our children than what we had. And we're doing it the right way. We're working really hard. There are a lot of people I know. By the grace of God, we all have great jobs and we're having a lot of fun doing it. But there are a lot of my friends that hate their job. They hate going to work every day. They're doing it to pay their bills. And and that's the that's Donald Trump is giving them a voice. It is not an elite group in Washington. It is not big city New York or big big state California DC, that's controlling this anymore. New York, L.A., San Francisco. But look at the rest of the map. Right. It's mostly red. Right. Um, we've gone through this now with with two election cycles. In 08, it was Barack Obama saying, you know, these bitter Americans clinging to their God, guns, Bibles, religion. And I'm like, what's wrong with that? Well, that's me. That's who I am. Yeah. So, and, or irredeemable deplorables right. that Hillary Clinton used. It shows such a deep contempt. They're sick of it. And these same media people, they're all part of that establishment and that crowd, and they're all the ones that were surprised. Right. I was not surprised by the outcome. Mm -hmm. I, I knew it was a hard path, but a doable path. They thought there was no chance that Donald Trump could win. Right. Well, here's a perfect example. I read an article that said something about what Obama wanted to do after his presidency. And he was saying that the Democratic Party needed to get out, and they need to get out and talk to the people and tell them about their programs and tell them why it works and why they should vote the way they vote, right? So in my mind, what I'm hearing him say is that he needs to get out and indoctrinate the people into going with the theory that they've developed as best for the but country. He had eight versus years. asking people, what do you want? That's what freedom is. That's what this democracy is. It's getting out and saying, people, what do you want? And let us go to government and represent you. And to me, that's a fundamental difference, and that's where it's getting lost. Yeah. They want to create the narrative. So go back to your friends that maybe people that you know in your life that don't like their jobs. I went through 20 years of blue-collar work in my life. It's not that I didn't like it. I like this a lot better. Right. But it's hard. And, these, and the average American has been struggling for eight years, and I can't cite a single economic statistic that shows Obama's been successful. Yeah, I mean, I have friends that want to have big families, and they can't because they can't afford having more than one or two children. I have, people, I have friends that are putting $7 in the tank when they go to the gas tank, $7.53, because that's all they have in their wallet, that are still bouncing checks or living paycheck to paycheck. And these are people, my friends, that are in their 40s. You mm -hmm. know, it's not like we're in our 20s anymore when we all did that kind of thing to survive. That was a long but, time ago for me, but, but uh, yeah, those, for you girls, okay, 20s, you can <laughs> still remember ago, right? those years. Great. Yeah. I know, but I mean, he gives them a voice and he gives them hope that they're not, that he's not going to increase taxes. He's going to lower taxes. He's going to improve race relations, people are hoping. And he's just going to keep jobs here and keep our country safer. That's why I call this election the forgotten man, forgotten woman election. Those are the people that won that for Donald Trump. Mm -hmm. Good to see you both. Congrats on your contributorship. Thank you. Congrats on number one on your book. Thank you.